That's right. That's right. That's my king. And I want to tell you right now that, you know, he is king. And, you know, it's funny because I had three people pray over me this morning and they all prayed the same thing and it's dangerous because they prayed that I would say what God put on my heart even if it isn't on my paper. And that's dangerous to say to me. (laughs) But I want to tell you right now that God, that Jesus is king. And he does not need your acknowledgement to be sovereign. He does not need your endorsement to be king. He is. He's king by right. He's king by birth, and he's king by victory. I heard a sermon preached one time that talked about that the, the Jesus going to the cross was the greatest vision of passivity. passivity. It was Jesus' example to us. But I want to tell you right now, that Jesus going to the cross was an act of aggression. It was my king going to war for me. It was my king delivering a blow to the devil. It was my king making a way for me to be reconciled to him. And that's my king. Do you know him? I love how, how Dr. Lockridge says that. Do you know him? Because that is the question that we come to today. Uh, I called Chris Carpenter, and he said he couldn't make it, so my name's Chris Barnett. (laughs) And I decided to go on and, you know, come out today. I I am the family life minister here at Oakwood. And, uh, you know, we're going to be talking today about practical evangelism, telling about our king. And, you know, when you put, that, you put that out there, practical evangelism, what in the world is that? Well, practical means the actual act of doing something. It's not concerned with the ideas. It's not concerned with the theory really behind it. It is concerned with the action of it. Where the rubber hits the road, you put it into action. Evangelism, it's based on three things. There are three actions that are involved in evangelism. And the the first action is telling the good news. Spreading the good news. So what's the good news? Well, the good news is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's my king. He gave his life for me. And that is good news. And that is what we should be sharing. But there's another action. There's an act, another action, and, and John the Baptist did this at, in, in the, when, before he would baptize people. He would say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's announcing the kingdom. Jesus talked about this in parables. He compared the kingdom of God with a mustard seed. He said that uh, you would have to co- become like a little child. Because the kingdom of God belong to such as these. And then there's a third action, which is bearing witness. And when you bear witness to something, you have to actually experience it. It's hard to bear witness to something that you haven't gone through yourself. Now, I have have to confess, this message is not new. It's something that I did for the students back uh, in Prairie View several weeks ago, and I had a a couple of people that says, you know, that that really would preach. And I was like, well, maybe, 
you know, and then God arranged it to where, hey, it will preach because I'm putting you up there, you know. So, you know, this is a divine appointment. This isn't something that to where, uh, you know, Eric just needed somebody to feel the, the platform. It is something that God arranged and said, this is what I want shared. So, I want you to listen up because we're going to be talking about the king today. All right? When you're talking about practical evangelism, before you ever get into the actual evangelism part of it, there are prerequisites. And I want to go over the prerequisites, prerequisites because that's what's important. That's what, we're, what is really important right now is the first prerequisite that we're talking about. We're talking about that you have to actually have the experience. You have to actually possess a relationship with Jesus Christ. It can't be just something that you proclaim to people. It's something that you have to actually experience. We're going to be, I want you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be in chapter 7 quite a bit. Uh, this first passage is going to start in verse 21, but we'll go back and pick up verse 15 in a little bit. But here in verse 21 of chapter 7, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. One of the scariest passages in the Bible. But I'm going to tell you something right now that might be a little bit of a shock. It takes more than belief to enter the kingdom of heaven. It takes more than belief for salvation. It takes a relationship with Jesus Christ for salvation. You cannot put your faith in praying a prayer one time when you were a little kid. You can't put your faith in walking an aisle. It takes a relationship with him. How do I know that? Because he just said that. These people are coming up and they have no credibility. They've been going through the motions. They've been sharing. They've been even casting out demons. But they have no relationship with him. What is the criteria? The criteria isn't that we know him. Jesus is famous. You go out on the street here in Eden and ask them ask people if they know who Jesus is and they'll be able to tell you who he is. That doesn't go, doesn't give you any uh, credibility to their soul disposition. They know who Jesus is. The question is, do they have a relationship with him? Do they know him? I always use with the students, I use the analogy of the president. If I walk up to the White House and I say, hey, I know the president, let me in. What are they going to say? No. We're going to call up the president. Hey, there's a goofy guy out here that's wanting in. Do you know him? He's going to look out. I don't know who he is. They're going to turn me away. But... If I'm walking up to the White House lawn and the president sticks his head out the window and sees me walking up and he goes, oh, I know him. I talked to him yesterday. I've talked to him every day since we became friends. Hey, guys, let him in. 
they're going to let me in based on his testimony, not based on mine. So the criterion for salvation is that you have a relationship. I want to get that squared away right off the bat. The criterion for salvation is a relationship with Jesus Christ. James says that even the demons believe and shudder because they know that who Jesus is. It's told several times in Scripture where they've seen Him coming and they start getting nervous right when they see Him. They know who Jesus is. But they don't have a relationship with Him. So salvation is out of their reach. So that is the first prerequisite is you have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't get any other thing from this message, get that. That your eternity is based on a relationship with Christ. If I talk to my wife maybe once a year at Christmas and Easter and don't ever talk to her at all or, or show up at the house at Christmas and Easter and that's the only time I'm there, guess what? I don't have a wife. It's the same thing. There has to be relationship. The second prerequisite that we come up against is that you have to have a sense of urgency. We are up against two deadlines in this world. And they're hard deadlines and they're, and they're uncertain timing to it. The first deadline, death. You know, 10 out of 10 dentist surveys surveyed will die. <laughs> they, they will. They, there's no way around that unless their name is Enoch. Then they might be able to pull it off. But, you know, we're up against a hard de deadline of death. Once death happens, it's a done deal. There is no hope. It's over. Whatever relationship they had or did not have has been decided. And so... That sense of urgency is there, that we have to be urgent about sharing with people because death is uncertain. Heaven forbid that anybody walks out this door and, and Crystal Honeycutt is driving by and hits them. <laughs> you know, that is something that we don't wish upon anybody, but, you know, Accidents happen all the time. Accidents happen and they're unforeseen. And death is something that can come at any time. So it is a hard deadline that we have to be cognizant about at all times. If you love somebody and you're not sharing with them the love of Jesus Christ because you're afraid of how they might react, what kind of love is that? The second deadline that we're up against is... Thank God, Christ is coming back. He's coming again. The Bible says that nobody knows when, but we see the signs. We see that there are signs that have been given to us that it is possible now. Since 1948, it is made possible that all of Revelation can be fulfilled now. Before 1948, People were going, how in the world is Revelation going to be fulfilled? There isn't a state of Israel. 1948, they stepped to the platform and announced the state of Israel. Guess what? Revelation just became a reality. It's possible now. So that deadline is looming. There's nothing standing in the way of that. So there is another deadline. The third prerequisite is that you have to have compassion for people. You have to have a compassion for people. Uh, a 
a care about them. I'm going to read, this is a lengthy quote from a man named Penn Gillette. He's a magician, uh, entertainer in Las Vegas. He's a self-proclaimed atheist. So, uh, you know, and he's very outspoken about it. He has this thing on the internet that I don't recommend that you go look at because it's not censored. It's called Penn Says... And after his show, he gives a kind of synopsis of, you know, how he feels. Just a little video blog of what happened. And this quote is from when a guy came forward after one of his shows and handed him a Gideon Bible. And if you look at this video, you can tell that he is shaken by that act of kindness. And he says that in, in, in the video, he says this man is a good man. And he's sane. That's one thing that he keeps on saying. He's sane, which is, I guess, what atheists think about Christians, is that we're not sane. But this is the quote that Penn Gillette, self-proclaimed atheist, says... He says, if you believe that there is a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell or not going to heaven, and you think that it's not worth telling them this because it could be socially awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? Now, proselytize just means sharing your faith. How much do you have to hate somebody by not sharing the faith? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and you don't believe it? If I believe there is a truck about to run over you and you don't believe it, and this truck is bearing down on you, there's a point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. That's coming from an atheist. He turns it around to a lot of us, you know, well, it's, you know, socially not acceptable for us to share the faith. This atheist says, no, it's an act of hate. How much do you have to hate somebody to not tell them? Ezekiel actually says that you'll be held accountable for not telling them. So that's a scary thought. That you have to care about people to be, have that sense of urgency to tell them. These all build upon each other. If you don't have that relationship with Christ, then you won't care about people. If you don't have that relationship with Christ, then you won't be urgent. If you don't have that relationship with Christ, then you won't evangelize. How do you know if you have that relationship? Well, let's go to Matthew, same chapter, chapter 7, 15, verse 15 through 20. It says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So is fruit that we recognize each other. It is fruit, the spiritual fruit of a person's salvation that declares, that makes that proclamation, that bears witness to what they're saying is credible. You can go around and quote John 3.16 all you want to, but if your lifestyle doesn't match up, then how credible are you? 
How credible is your witness? You know, Jesus lived for 33 years. He did ministry for three of those years. Full-time ministry was in for three of those years. And the whole time, he walked a certain walk. And that walk is what we examine today. We, we read the Bible and we hear a lot about what he said. But if he just spoke and didn't live the life that he lived, he did not live a perfect life, but just talked about it, how effectual would his sacrifice been? It wouldn't have been effectual at all. He had to live a sinless, perfect life for that sacrifice to be effectual for our salvation. And he did that. And if that is your king, if you proclaim that that is your king, then you'll evangelize. That's why I called it this, the, the title was Practical Evangelism, is because it's natural. It's something that you do. If you are a saved believer in Christ, then you will evangelize. You won't be able to stop evangelizing. What happens when you hear about or when you experience a good restaurant? You tell people, hey, this is a good restaurant. You ought to go there. Same thing. What happens when you see a, a good movie? Hey, did you hear about this movie? You tell them about it. Does it reciprocate with Christ in our lives? When we say that we have experienced Christ, do we share that? There's a, a song that affected me. It was actually a video. It's called uh, The Lifehouse Skit. Uh, a teen group put it on in... Tennessee several years ago, and I showed it for the, the Prairie View uh, camp. I'm, I don't have the time to show it for us, but it's uh, called the Everything Skit. But the thing that really affected me on that is the song that they use is the song Everything by Lighthouse, Lifehouse. And the chorus of the song says, how can I stand here with you and not be moved by you? How can I stand here with you and not be moved by you? How can we proclaim the name of Christ and not bear any effects of a relationship with Him? It would be the same analogy that I use uh, with the students of, uh, of what if I came up here and I said, okay, uh, I'm sorry I'm late. I missed the, the, the music time because on my way here, I got a flat tire and I was out changing my tire and a truck came by and hit me. And it drug me all the way to Wacomas. And finally, I worked myself free and ran all the way back here, got my tire changed, got up here, and here I am. What would y'all think about me? <laughs> I'm a liar. <laughs> because why? Because I bear no evidence to an encounter with a Mack truck. <laughs> but every day we proclaim that we have an encounter with some, a being that is so much more powerful than a truck. But we bear no evidence. That is what is keeping the lost in their seats. Is because our lives are not credible. Our 
lives don't match up with our words. And that's something that we really need to examine. Is, is our evangelism effectual? I call it practical evangelism because it's not forced. Whenever you experience something that is great, a new product, I mean, why do you think the as seen on TV things work so well? It's because, you know, you look at them and the people are all excited about it. I tried this and it worked. All right, well, that makes me want to try it. That's what practical evangelism is. It is just sharing your experience with Christ. Not trying to, you know, memorize the whole book of John and then regurgitating it for people. It's sharing with people what God has done in your life. So the question that I want to ask today is the same question that Dr. Lockridge started off. Do you know him? I wonder if you know him. Because if you don't, we're going to have a time here of decision. And if you are not just explicitly sure that your life is bearing fruit, that if you're in a place where that you just feel like you're digging a hole. I had a friend tell me one time, you know, feel, I said, I feel like I'm just digging a hole. And he says, stop digging. You just keep digging deeper and you get stuck more. It's time to turn it over to Christ. Another uh, friend of mine uh, talked about Matt Lohman. He talked about at Hope Outreach, we were in a, 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 a devotional one time and he was talking about when you're going through hell, the worst thing you can do is stop. Keep going. Push through. God is right there with you. He's pulling you. If you could see the everything skit, you'll see this guy on the other side depicting God and he's sitting there just pulling as hard as he can, getting you through it. He is there. He's with us. And that's my question is, do you know him? If you don't know him, we're going to have the decision room open. We're going to have some elders and some, some other leaders over there that are going to be available to speak to you about how you can make sure that you have this relationship with Christ that we're talking about. Because if you don't want to evangelize, if that's something that you just feel like, that's, I, I would rather go to the dentist. Really, you need to examine because a life of true relationship with Christ is a life that says, I, I can't hold it back. This person over here needs to know what I know. Like Penn Jillette said, if, if you don't tell them, how much do you have to hate them? That was a sobering thought because I was one of those Christians several years ago that was like, oh, well, my, my walk, Christian walk is words enough. They'll be able to see it. No. You need to have the walk, but you also need to express the knowledge. You also need to express your experience because nobody can they can't, they can't go against your experience. This is what happened in my life. You tell them that, they might be able to refute. Well, the Bible is man-made. and No, no, it's not. But this is what happened in my life. There's no refuting that. So we're going to enter a decision time today. And 
you know, I really want you in the quiet time as the band is, is setting, uh, playing, and they're going to be singing a song. I think that it, it, it's the song forever, and it's one of my favorite songs. And it talks about the lordship of Jesus Christ. There's a, you know, Jesus is Lord whether you want him to be or not. Whether you acknowledge him to be or not, he's Lord. He is the king. And either you can make a choice for him today or at some point in time, the choice will be made for you. Because the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, as we're going into this time, I want you to really examine. Is there fruit? Does Jesus know me? I know I know him. But he's famous. Does he know me?